just a quick introduction to Tasman 3D printers. You know, we've been in business for over 40 years supplying um, injection molding equipment to the plastics industry in Australia and New Zealand. And since we introduced 3D printing to our business uh, about five years ago, we've become one of the leading suppliers of Stratasys 3D printers in a wide variety of industries. We only represent Stratasys, and Stratasys are the world leader in 3D printers. It would be impossible to start a webinar about 3D printing and innovation if we weren't also looking at the innovation climate in Australia and where we actually stand. One of the key reasons that we want to innovate in Australia is the fact that it leads to increased profitability. It really improves the way a business performs. Um, and research done by the Australian Innovation System Report, which is a government-funded report, indicates that Australian companies who innovate, uh, and whether that be by introducing new products to market or new products to the company, are substantially more likely to report increased profitability, increased uh, revenue, as well as they're more likely to export and have improved productivity and employment. And that on its own should be a good enough reason for all organizations in Australia to be putting money into R&D and innovation. What's unfortunate when you look at the statistics is that Australia has shown a serious decline in new, new to market product innovation since the early 2000s. So in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, Australia was very innovative. And when you look online and you do some research, you can see that so many things we take for granted now in Australia and globally were innovated, invented, and developed during that period. But since the 2000s, there's been a severe decline, now putting Australia behind countries like Croatia, Estonia, Slovakia, and then also behind major um, manufacturing powerhouses like Germany, UK, um, Italy, France. And it clearly shows to us the importance of starting to create a innovation culture. And not just an innovation culture in our businesses, but an innovation culture in our schools and in the way we do everything. What is innovation? It's you know, there's a vast industry that looks at what innovation is and how to innovate. But simplistically speaking, we can look at innovation as any new product or process to market or any new product or process to the company. And innovation quite clearly falls in this sweet spot of between what's viable, what's desirable, and what's possible with existing technology. And 3D printing has the ability to add value to each one of those sectors. 3D printing allows you with a sector what's desirable to users to create functional parts that can go into focus groups, that can go into market and be tested functionally prior to the expenditure of um, enormous amounts of money or resources. 3D printing is a new technology that increases what is possible, that expands the scope of what's possible. And it also allows you to follow with that old mantra of fail often but fail quickly it allows you to test the viability of a concept very cost effectively and very fast. You know, the software industry works with that mantra of fail often, fail quick. And 3D printing in a manufacturing environment provides the same benefit or the same potential. It allows you to test concepts very quickly to verify whether it will work very quickly before sinking huge amounts of costs. So simplistically speaking, where we are in Australia right now is we sit with a market uh, that's showing a decline in innovation. The government is talking about improving innovation. We all recognize we need to improve innovation. And innovation naturally is not just about 3D printing. This is only one small scope of it. My name is Nikki Cowan. I am the founder and CEO of Normal. At Normal, it's quite simple. We make custom 3D printed earphones. I started Normal because of the problem that many of us experience of ill-fitting earphones. Nothing fit, everything hurt. When you work out, they fall. When you're on long planes, they hurt. Um, so, I kind of wanted to go through uh, the process of getting a pair of custom made for me. The ways that existed to make custom made for was through cast, through you know, silicone molds, and through a process that takes weeks and is hundreds of thousands of dollars. I've been around 3D printing and manufacturing and production for a while, and I was thinking, like, there's got to be a way to do this by 3D printing. So we're excited to be able to use 3D printing to make a product that is 
more affordable from a time and cost perspective to more consumers. We take a photo of each of your ears while holding up a quarter for scale, and we turn that into a product that is completely personalized for you. So customize the colors, the cable, whatever. Uh, and this product is ready for you in as little as 48 hours. 3D printing allows us to do this at a price point that makes sense. The economics make sense for us and for the consumer. And it allows us to make a really beautiful premium product, both from a sound and fit perspective. When I launched Normal, I had no debate in my mind. The machine I wanted to use was going to be the Stratasys Fortis 250. I knew that it would give me the quality and the speed and the ease of use and the factory sort of ability that I needed to, to have Normal. The model that we have is very simple to operate. Um, again, this is a mass-produced consumer product. So we needed a machine that would allow us to operate at a factory mass scale. Remember, we're selling a premium product, and the resolution is, is great, right? It matches that premium price point, that amazing sound, that personalized fit you get. We are currently printing with ABS. We have seven different color ABS. After the product gets printed on our machine, there's some post-processing that happens where it gets cleaned, where it gets sanded, where it gets smoothed, and actually we coat it with some soft touch spray to give it a nice soft touch. At Normal, we really want to celebrate the fact that these are 3D printed. We're proud of that. When customers come through the door, they are super excited about what this space is. It's this retail and factory and, and shop and office all in one. Um, they get really excited to be able to see their product being made live in front of their eyes, to be able to see the assembly line run and to be able to see the staff at work. For a lot of people, they've never seen a 3D printer before. So there's this really fun educational piece as well in the store where we have our factory team helping the customer, talking them through what is actually going on in that machine. This is the first real application of 3D printing for a, a mass-produced consumer good, but the idea could be a lot bigger than headphones. So uh, we'll, we'll see what other, uh, what other things. So the purpose of that video was to show you what true innovation is. So she's taken a product that is pretty normal, yet we all complain about the way it performs. And using 3D printing, she's not only created a new product, she's created a new business. So she's changed her value chain and she's changed the way she goes to market. So 3D printing has, in her business, enabled the innovation. Without 3D printing, she would have not been able to, or they would not have been able to innovate the product. And there is no reason why that product and that innovation could not have happened in Australia. She may have a shop for floor or a shop front, but a lot of the business they do is online and digital all enabled by 3D printing. So the question could be next is, well, where's 3D printing heading? Surely it's new. And 3D printing is not new. For a lot of you, you'll realize that 3D printing has been around for more than 30 years in a variety of forms. So 3D printing has arrived. You know, the press would have us believe with the way they uh, reported that 3D printing is brand new and 3D printing sprang up fully formed five years ago with the uh, the format of the consumer 3D printers, but it's been around a long time. It's been through a lot of challenges. The limiting factors when 3D printing was first um, developed were the power of computers, the uh, cost of CAD and the complexity of CAD. But now with CAD becoming far easier to get to access, far more cost effective to access, and with computing power so inexpensive, 3D printing now is reaching out into the industry floor and to, and to the shop floor and into educational institutions. And the only thing limiting its growth is not the machine itself, but rather the ability of end users to use the, the device, to realize that it is a manufacturing tool or a design tool and has genuine functionality. It's not purely about rapid prototyping. And Gartner did a 2005 or 2015 survey where they looked at the hype around 3D printing. And 3D printing can be divided into two clear sectors, consumer 3D printing, which we refer to as 3D printing, and enterprise 3D printing, which we often refer to as additive manufacturing. And those are in different life cycles at the moment. So for consumer 3D printing, which is the low cost machines um, that you buy for sub $5,000 that you can get at a variety of retail outlets, those would be consumer 3D printers. And they're entering this area, which Gartner quite melodramatically calls the trough of disillusionment. And that's in some respects driven by the press, where the press announces 3D printing and says, these devices can do whatever you want. And that's not true. Every device has something it's good at. 
and you cannot buy a consumer machine and expect that it's going to produce parts instantaneously. The limiting factor for consumers is the ability to design parts, is the ability to get access to printable parts. Enterprise 3D printing or additive manufacturing has been through that cycle. It's now on the upward cycle where it is truly in many markets becoming a tool that sits in a factory that has a variety of applications. It's an educational tool. It's a production tool. It's something that has functionality and purpose. It's not just there to print off or make off a few prototypes or for its fun value. It has a genuine value. And one of the key issues with this is, is to have a look at what materials and what applications are out there and available uh, in 3D printers and to realize that there are many people doing effective work with it. I found this, this, this note in the Harvard Business Review which appealed to me and it says 3D printing sounds futuristic like the meals that materialize in the Jetsons oven at the touch of the keypad. But the technology is quite for, straightforward. It's a small evolutionary step to putting down layers, to creating something more substantial. And it's what we often say to people, yes, 3D printing was revolutionary. It was incredibly innovative when it was developed in the 80s. But now 3D printing is a machine. It's a device. It's something that can be used. And what's more important is what comes out of it, the parts that you can use and how you can apply them, and also the real complexity and the real innovation and the real beauty of 3D printing is what you, the designers and the manufacturers, put through the device. The hard work is the design. The 3D printer is a simple tool and unlike lathes or CNC machines require no complex training. They're very simple to use. They're push button at use. The challenges and the complexity come with the designs, with the CAD, with coming up with innovative concepts and ideas. And the beauty of 3D printing is it allows you to do process and product optimization and allows you to review and totally redesign your products and your processes. And with 3D printing, complexity is free. What does that mean? In traditional manufacturing, which 3D printing cannot replace, the higher the quantity and the lower the complexity, the more acceptable or the better cost position is hit by conventional manufacturing. But the minute complexity goes up and your volumes are relatively low, we say sub 1,000 parts a year, 3D printing starts to have substantial benefits over traditional manufacturing. And why we say complexity is free, in traditional manufacturing, the more complex a part, the longer it takes to, the, to produce, or the more likely it is you cannot produce it in a single process and you need to have multiple processes or use multiple devices. Whereas in a 3D printer, because it's a layered approach, geometry is irrelevant to it. It doesn't care about where the cavities are or doesn't need to consider how to access a certain part. It puts it down layer by layer. And that will not change the nature of the product or the price of the product. In fact, the more complex a part is, the better it suits 3D printing. So it allows you to start designing for perfection or designing for application or designing for use rather than designing for manufacture. So we very blithely talk about how 3D printing is now a real world. And if you've ever used a hobbyist machine or a consumer machine, you may not um, realize what vast array of materials are available for 3D printers. So if you look just within the Stralysis range, and that's what I'll focus on naturally because that's what I do, you'll see within the thermoplastics area, we have materials that go from ABS or ASA, ASA is a UV resistant version of ABS, all the way through to high performance flame retardant chemical resistant polymers with flame smoke and toxicity ratings suitable for util utilization underground or in aeroplanes. With a vast array of materials in between, including food grade materials, including medical grade materials. In our polyjet photopolymer range, we can simulate over a thousand different materials, including rubber-like materials. We can produce biocompatible materials for hearing aids. We can produce dental materials, not for implant purposes, naturally. We can produce biocompatible materials that can cope with a 24-hour exposure to um, mucosal contact. 
so within these two technologies and these two materials you can see that the the scope of what's potential what's possible is enormous and this allows and enables innovation because you do not need to be limited by one or two materials you do not need to be limited by one or two devices it opens up an enormous scope for doing multiple styles of manufacturing and multiple types of products from a single device so to really express how 3d printing can assist innovation in australia and how it can help us make a difference i just want to look at a couple of advanced applications and then i'll give you some real world examples both american and australian and show you how people have taken this technology to make a difference to their businesses so we split our advanced applications into what we call direct usage where the parts come off the printer ready to use and indirect usage where we produce elements that are used to produce parts tools and molds etc so in direct usage we look at some of this, the the most obvious ones are jigs and fixtures and finished goods so jigs and fixtures allow for rapid enhanced faster better manufacturing operations because you can customize a jig or a fixture specifically for a need or an orientation or for a type of assembly directly from CAD when the designer is designing his finished product it's not a case of a designer finishing the product and then sending it off to the, the factory floor to have someone design or create a jig and fixture process Finished goods are real-world parts that come off the printer that are suitable for end-use applications, that go on aeroplanes, that go in rockets, that go in devices and machines. And we have numerous um, customers throughout Australia and New Zealand who make low-volume parts directly from the 3D printer. And the parts are made on a 3D printer simply because the volume is too low to justify tooling up for injection molding, or the complexity is such that there is no practical way to producing it or the customization requirements from the end market are so regular and so often that it makes no sense to tool up traditionally. The other are indirect usage applications are injection molding tools, blow molding tools, vacuum forming tools directly off a 3D printer, metal processing tools for sand casting or stretch forming or hydroforming, and then the composites, which is automotive and aeronautical and a variety of other applications, layup tools and soluble cores and, and trim tools. So these are real world applications that allow you to start looking at your processes and your products and say, how can we improve what we do? How can we enhance the way we do it and do it better or faster or more cost effectively? So that things like the distance Australia is from our standard markets or the cost of our labor becomes ir irrelevant because we do, we're doing it smarter and faster and better. Within those advanced applications, I've only focused on four to talk about today. There are too many to talk about and um, it would take a lot longer to do this webinar. So the first one is end of arm tools. And it may sound quite mundane, but most manufacturing concerns or large welding companies or companies who do laser cutting or injection molding have the requirement for robots to move parts around to assist with assembly the machining of custom tools can be a very tedious and very expensive process and the more weight you have at the end of your robot arm the more load you put on um, the mechanics and often the slower your arm has to move to cope with that inertia so by being able to custom design an end of arm tool in CAD when you're designing your products to print it gives you the benefits of enhanced speed, lower weights at the end of your robot arm, and the ability to genuinely perform faster and quicker and get to market faster. So this is an example of a company called Genesis who produced a uh, end of, or produces end of robot arms in a high performance material that can cope with temperatures of over 300 degrees C, chemical resistance, really, really high strength, and lightweight. And the benefit of this material, it can be printed in a honeycomb structure to even further reduce the weight and increase the rigidity. Vacuum tubes can be printed into um, the tool so that you don't have to have vacuum hoses hanging outside the tool, for instance, if you're creating a, a vacuum grabbing device. So there's a lot of benefits. And this is an innovation. This becomes, forms part of process innovation. You know, innovation doesn't just have to be about a new product, it's about new processes. If you have a traditional robot environment, this allows you to improve your processes, to speed them up, 
to reduce your costs. So Genesis found exactly what I said. They've improved their performance and functionality. They were able to reduce their cost by creating very complex parts or complex tools in a single process. And it enables them to do iterative design. You know, design it, print it, verify whether they're happy with it, go back to CAD, review it, and reproduce it to ensure they get it right first time. Whereas in a traditional environment, if you design it, and you then send off and have it tooled or machined up, you may be loath to change it if it's not perfect. You may end up living with um, a compromised situation. So that's an ability to, to do process innovation using um, 3D printing. Another process innovation is what we call jigs and fixtures. This is an American company called Solaxis who simply created a jig and a fixture, or they were specialized in jigs and fixtures, but in this particular case, they created a carrying device to enable on the production floor all the parts to be correctly assembled, correctly put in place, and moved around the, the production floor. Again, making it easier for parts, uh, for uh, staff members, less risk of repetitive strain injuries, reducing cycle times, and reducing costs. And I just have a brief video, and hopefully the videos are coming through okay, um, to talk you through this process. I'm the owner and president of Solaxis, and we're located in Pomo, Quebec. We use 3D printing everywhere. It's our core business, especially for specialized tooling and then functional. They had targeted solution. They wanted to make sure all their operators could lift the desktop jig uh, by themselves. Crisis 3D printing really helped us speed up everything. Normally, they get these jigs that are traditionally made in other types of machining 60 to 20 weeks. We managed to do all of this with the printing in three to five weeks. Everything was to speed up production. We brought the buttons closer to the operator, we brought the clip closer to the operator. It was really optimized on every version of subsequent projects. The benefit for our customers of having jigs that are redesigned for one us to reduce their cycle time by four seconds per cycle, knowing that they will be almost started to get the one part per year. Also, uh, by providing a plastic jig instead of metal jig, allows them to reduce the, the weight of the jig. So it's very lightweight, only about 28 pounds. Travis's two printers are mostly unique because of the fact of having extruded plastic. Extruded plastic allows us to have really uh, stronger parts. You don't need to think about the tooling you're really free to create however you want your part. We started with one Stratasys 3D printing system, and now because of demand, we're up to five. In the automotive industry, 3D printing is really moving from prototyping to manufacturing applications. It's really in supporting tier two or tier three uh, manufacturers that are supplying automotive industry, large OEMs, get all their product out there faster. Then move on to part optimization or the ability to produce something that's unproducible in a traditional environment. NASA had the challenge where they were looking for the ability to produce complex structures and complex shapes as a single piece. Because what they did, they improved the strength, reduced the risk of failure, um, and also allowed them to do assembly substantially faster. So we have this ability to print pr produce aeronautically approved materials, um, a product called Ultim 9085. So NASA using this FDM technology was able to totally redesign a traditional part and go through and deliver a structural element directly from a 3D printer faster. It also allowed them to do everything we always talk about, which is iterative, iterative design, verify part performance, verify design credibility, prior to sending it um, to market. So the purpose of the three I've shown you so far is to show you that it's possible to functionally use things from a 3D printer, and how having access to a 3D printer allows you to innovate parts and processes. Unilever, as a big consumer uh, vendor, 
for them, it's all about speed to market. For them, it's all about getting the right design in front of a customer so they can verify it and they can do focus groups and they can know that what's been designed is correct. So with Unilever, they did a slightly different approach. They were not looking for providing a 3D printed part to the focus groups to test. They wanted to have a real world part like what you would expect to purchase when you take it off the shelf. So they need to produce something in polypropylene with um, a perfectly smooth finish because that's what in that environment, that's what the consumer would expect. A ridged finish in a, in a toilet cleaning environment would collect dirt and bacteria. The way they used 3D printing there was printing an injection molding tool directly from a 3D printer, putting it on an injection molder and being able to then produce a finished part very cost effectively within 24 hours at substantially reduced costs um, in the real material. So they could then package it, assemble it and put it in front of focus groups and physically use it. So all of, an, all of a sudden 3D printing there has added value because it's created the ability to do genuine manufacture on an injection molder in the materials you want with the finish you want cost effectively. A traditional hard tool for this for injection molding would cost possibly $10,000 and take four to six weeks to produce. With a 3D printer, that tool could be produced for about seven or $800 overnight, taken off the printer, cleaned and put directly in the factory floor. It doesn't replace traditional tooling because you can only get about 150 to 200 shots out of a tool, depending on what your um, end product is. But again, it enables innovation. Many companies in Australia, specifically because of the size of our market and because we start with a non-export mindset, we realize that the potentials, potential uptake is low. So many companies are loath to go and spend tens of thousands of dollars in hard tooling for something which is just an idea. 3D printing enables these companies for minimal cost to produce an injection molding tool to verify their design in the real world on an injection molder and create the finished product. Injection molding tools also allow companies who only want ever to do a small volume to do so. So that's a real change to the way companies can go to market with injection molded products. I spoke earlier on about um, complexity is free. And I did some work with a company called Leap Australia who are the vendors for Creo, which is a uh, CAD package in Australia. And there we said, you know, what many people do when they have a 3D printer, they take a traditional design or they design traditionally and they put it onto the 3D printer and use it. But sometimes what you do is you miss out on the magic of 3D printing. So 3D printing allows you to, de to design very complex parts and produce them very simply. And in fact, the less material you use, the cheaper the part becomes. So what we did with Leap was we took a traditional part, we did an FEA analysis to work out where the loads were, where the strength was required, and we designed an optimum part, which led to a 60% reduction in weight, a 60% reduction in cost, and an optimized strength part, and made no real difference to, uh, the comp to how we produced it. In fact, this one we produced quicker and cheaper than the original design. So we, we often say to people, when you start to design, if you want to design for printed performance, if you want to design knowing that you will produce a part on a printer, you can start to throw some of your old design um, rules out of the window because draft angles become less relevant. You do not need to worry about tool access or how to produce it because the printer doesn't really care. So it's a great example of how you can innovate existing parts by increasing strength, reducing cost, and reducing um, weight by using 3D printing. There's a number of specialist applications as well. And I said here, I believe these are ripe for innovation in Australia. And you may be surprised that I've included automotive there considering we are closing down so many automotive plants. But we've seen an increase in automotive aftermarket. One, because of the decline in the Australian dollar at the moment, and two, the fact that Australia, brand Australia, has value outside of Australia, and we're a car-loving nation. So we believe there's still a lot of potential for innovation in Australia in the aftermarket or OEM supply. 
Medical modeling is a potential growth area that's ripe for innovation. Dental modeling, you know, 3D printed dental tools or, or dental parts are becoming almost the norm in the USA and parts of Europe. Whereas in Australia, it has been slow to take off. The benefit of dental um, or innovation in dental is the fact that you no longer need to store uh, alginate models. You no longer need to work on alginate models. You can do it all visually or virtually and print out your tool, which gives you increased speed, increased ability to innovate your product and to make your life simpler. So I'm going to give you one example here, and this is Kobe University in Japan. They had a challenge with some of the surgery they were doing. They couldn't actually see where the tumors were, where the um, veins and arteries were going, and it, it created a potential challenge. And what they didn't want to do was go into the surgery and find that they'd made a mistake. So in a single print process, using CT scan data, they were able to print off that clear model with the veins and the arteries and, and the ducts all highlighted in different colors to allow for simple pre-surgical planning. There's a lot of work happening in Australia with this, but there's no one, it's not true, there's only one company so far who has genuinely commercialized this as an application. So this is a very large potential application for Australia um, for innovation. There are a lot of obstacles for implementing 3D printing. One of the biggest obstacles is um, Research has shown that often on a factory floor, um, a lot of people in the design team or on the factory floor will understand 3D printing or have a vague knowledge about 3D printing. But often the CEOs themselves, the people who sign the checks, aren't exposed to this. And it becomes very, very hard to justify when you want to invest in a 3D printer when people are looking at a simple ROI. And when you look at how diverse the potential applications are for a 3D printer in, in an environment, it's sometimes very hard to develop a simple ROI. If you purchased a Fortis 250 and put in a production plant today, it would have benefits in the design team, the sales and marketing team, the production team, the uh, maintenance team. All of those teams could achieve cost savings and benefits from having a 3D printer. But because of the diversity, it becomes quite hard to do an ROI. So we, we often see a lot of the obstacles that people put up and say, oh, these are our concerns. One of them naturally is part cost because 3D printed materials are specific to 3D printers and they are often more expensive per kilogram than traditional materials. But there's a number of ways we can assist you with by addressing that, by changing the orientation of the part, by optimizing the design for additive manufacturer, by managing the way you deal with that part, we can reduce costs. People have concerns about uh, part properties. This can be dealt with by um, choosing the right materials, selecting materials to give you the performance you require, by again working to optimize part or orientation, by doing analyses or topology um, analyses to optimize the design for additive manufacturing. And it is possible either during or after the print process to insert um, metal threads or metal bushes or metal parts. Uh, and you can also post plate 3D printed parts to enhance, enhance its strength. We've seen a substantial increase in strength on taking a pure plastic part and chrome plating it. We have the question about aesthetics. Yes, a 3D printed part does not look like an injection molded part. We're not at that spot yet. We're getting there, but we're not there yet. But again, we can manipulate this by uh, optimizing the part orientation in the printer, by working with you to look at post-processing um, methodologies for improving the surface finish, and again, for optimizing the design for additive manufacture, not just taking a, uh, an injection molded design and transferring it direct into a 3D printer. And then there's the question about accuracy and fitment. For our larger production oriented machines, we can provide accuracy data we know how they perform and we can prove how they perform. But again, we can address accuracy and fitment with orientation, um, with uh, optimizing the design. And then there are practical things that can be done where if you have ultra critical surfaces, those can be post machined. You can treat a 3D printed part like you would treat a piece of metal or a piece of wood when it comes out the printer and you can glue it and screw things to it and sand it and post machine it. You may not need to and naturally the the sheer beauty of uh, 3D printing is to work in an environment where you don't have to post finish. But for specialist applications, post finishing is absolutely possible. 
So I did say at the beginning I wouldn't just give you a sales pitch. I'd actually show you some innovation stories um, that relate around product and process innovation. And these are what I would consider to be genuine innovation stories. And the first one is is an American one, and it's UPS. And UPS in 2013 looked at the potential 3D printing has to disrupt the logistics chain. Theoretically speaking, in 10 or 15 years or in five years' time, there could be multi, multiple mini factories or people could be emailing designs to a factory somewhere else to have them printed locally. So to ensure that they were ready for this disruption, if it comes, they decided to, in 100 different locations across the USA, they naturally started out with a smaller pilot study, they decided to put in Stratasys Uprint SE Plus 3D printers, which what we would consider to be our entry-level industrial machine. Very, very accurate, can produce fantastically strong plants. And their idea was to put it into their UPS stores that already do photocopying and two-dimensional printing to en enable people in local industries to produce. And he has a brief video, um, hopefully you'll be able to hear it clearly, um, that talks, talks you through an innovation journey. for years when it started to kind of surface in the in the community as kind of a do-it-yourself thing I thought it was pretty amazing uh, so I've been following it very closely since news started hitting everywhere about 3d printing but I was always kind of frustrated because people seem to always just print trinkets and toys during my research I came up with this idea on how I felt I could use 3d printing for a positive change for, for actual good it all began with Christian. You know, I, I was talking with this this guy online about gaming and about playing first-person shooters. I, I grew up with video games. I've loved playing games my whole life. And he was saying that he loved it too, but, you know, he, he's got some other problems playing games. Christian could not physically reach the buttons because he has muscular dystrophy. He sent me pictures of his hands and pictures of him holding the controller so I could get a feel for how his hands were placed on the controller. And I started designing just a piece of plastic that would attach to the triggers that would reach to the optimal place for his hand to be able to push the trigger. For Christian, we measured it out, we figured how it would need to be placed, what the curve would have to be to fit his hands. And once I got it done, sent him pictures, he said, yeah, it looks perfect. Then I packed it all up, I shipped it back to him, and he tried it out, and he said it was great. It's, you know, he's finally able to push those triggers, which allows you to do things like shoot in the games, which is pretty important. As it turns out, working with Christian ended up helping some other people as well. Every time I make a file for one of these people, I publish it online for free. So locations like a UPS store would be perfect. You can download this file, walk into a UPS store, print it out. It takes 15, 20 minutes, and then you walk out with these parts that can help somebody be able to play games. It feels so good to send somebody a controller and have them say, thanks, that helped me. I can play now. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm just being totally selfish because that feels good to me. I'm Caleb Kraft, and I'm an inventor. <laughs> So there's a clear example there of how access to 3D printing allowed Caleb to innovate and invent. And sure, he did it as a non-profit, and that's fantastic. And what he's done has added a lot of value and that would not have been possible if 3D printing did not exist. And that's the innovation and invention we need to inspire in Australia. I've got three great Australian examples. One is a Sydney-based company called 3D Autospace who recognized that the, th the automotive repair market had changed. We'd gone from 10, 15 years ago, uh, people repairing um, panels or lights or bumpers to just replacing them. So if you knocked the headlight on your car and you drove into a panel shop and they looked at it and they noticed that the lugs were broken on the headlight, they would just replace the whole headlight. 
what this ended up doing was creating an environmental nightmare because that all needs to be disposed of. It pushed up costs. It cost the insurance companies a, a lot, which naturally ends us up costing us in our insurance policies. And this company will only go to market on November the 1st, so you're having early access to this information, decided that there would be value in spending time working with insurance companies to find out which are the top 20 or 30 headlights and bumpers that get replaced in Australia. They then went to scrapyards and bought, also went and bought um, headlights where they couldn't get them from scrap, like, scrapyards, scanned the lugs that typically break, insert, took that file into CAD, inserted part numbers so it's traceable, um, and created a database of lugs versus headlights and bumpers versus various models. And the whole model will be that they will have a centralized, or they, they have a centralized 3D printer that sits at their main uh, purpose, that turns out the, the bulk volume of stuff you need. And then they will decentralize printing throughout Australia and eventually New Zealand, whereby if someone arrives and says, I have Mercedes-Benz and my headlight's gone and these lugs are broken, they will print it out on site. And using either old-fashioned plastic welding or very sophisticated glues and adhesives from 3M that are approved, they will then allow the, the panel shop to repair that headlight. And they're working with the insurance companies to make sure this is insurance approved. And this really is an incredible innovation with regards to both product and process that has benefits on our pockets at the end of the day, increased profitability for um, panel shops and for the insurance companies, and an improved um, carbon footprint or an improved environmental footprint. And this is an Australian innovation, only possible with 3D printing. There was no way that this could have happened before because with injection molding, the costs of producing a hard tool for every single lug would have been in the tens of thousands of dollars. So his investment would have had to be in two, three, four, five million dollars just in tools before he was even able to start producing any parts. And then he would have had to keep it on um, inventory and his inventory costs would have been enormous. So this is quite clearly how in Australia an innovation has been 100% enabled by 3D printing. Another great example is down here in Melbourne with a small company who started off, a young man who bought his first 3D printer 18 months ago and within uh, 12 months had, in, had uh, doubled his capacity by buying uh, a second larger, more higher performance 3D printer. But this is not his story. This is a story about a backyard inventor who was a cricket pro and who taught cricket and he believed that he had come up with a perfect idea to create a little device that goes in the glove to improve the way players held the bat, the way players um, played their stroke. And he'd invented it and built it out of plasticine and clay in his backyard, and he had no practical way of getting it to market. He went to an injection molding company, and they, their answer was, yes, we can do it for you, but you need to order a minimum of 5,000 of these, and you need to spend $10,000 on a hard tool, and he couldn't justify that cost. There's no way he would recoup his investment because it's a relatively small market. And then he met the guys at Folium 3D and using a 3D printer, they went through an iterative design process, five, six, seven or eight designs until they got it perfect. Designs that he was able to put in his glove and test. Then from the printer, they created a, a mold, which they then made silicone versions to get the sure hardness right of what they needed. And once that was right, they then went and had a hard tool made and they were able to go to market and now they work with Cricket Australia and have this Cricket Australia approved training device. Again, only enabled without 3D printing. And if this inventor, backyard inventor, had not come across 3D printing or 3D printing had not existed, this product may never have come to market. And summer, summer, the summer cricket season may tell us whether it was worthwhile or not. And then the last very big um, innovation that I've seen um, is a company called Keech 3D. They were a pattern making shop based in regional Victoria who produce patterns for the Keech foundry. As we all may know, the foundry industry is a dying industry in Australia with a lot of it offshoring. But Keech is a family owned company and Keech is committed to being in Australia. So when I met the GM of the pattern making shop, we sat and looked at 3D printing and he recognized that it could add some value. And over a long 18 month period of negotiations and justifications, he eventually ended up spending almost three quarters of a million dollars on three 3D printers one to make patterns for the foundry, and two to make products for the rest of the market as a service bureau. 
He now has more than a million dollars worth of 3D printers. He's gone from employing 40 people to employing more than 20 people. He exports products to South America, to Europe, um, and produces products for the whole of Australia. Again, quite clear proof of process innovation and product innovation, creating jobs, employment, and an increase in revenue. So you may be sitting now and listening to me saying, that's fantastic, but I can, cannot see how additive manufacturing or 3D printing fits my business today. And it's pretty clear. Every company in Australia, every educational institution in Australia, anyone who has anything to do with design or manufacturing should be planning a strategy for additive manufacturing. You need to work out, is an opportunity to your existing business model? Is it going to change the way people buy products? Is it a threat? Is it going to make me um, or make my business no longer valid? So you need to develop a strategy for it. You need to plan how 3D printing or additive manufacturing will impact your business, whether positively or as a threat. And you cannot sit back and assume that just because it doesn't suit your needs today, that it won't in the future. Now, 3D printing, even though it's 30 years old and we consider it to be a well-established technology, is changing quite fast. We're introducing new materials and new applications on a daily basis. Additive manufacturing should be integrated in every design and manufacturing business. If you own CAD, if you do anything in CAD or teach anything in CAD, you should have an additive manufacturing device, a 3D printer. Additive manufacturing should be adopted and can be adopted into any present day existing value chain. It has a lot it can offer you and you should be working out what that is and what you're going to do about it. Even if you're not going to do anything about it, as a business, you should at least have taken the time and the consideration to evaluate the potential. And I just wanted to leave you with these two thoughts, uh, one from an American magazine and one from Australian Financial Review. And the one that appeals to me, because we often hear about the, co the high cost of labor in Australia, and this American magazine, because you know American manufacturing is now on a resurgence after 10 years of decline, and he simply says, 3D te technology dampens the wage incentive to produce overseas. We can produce in America products far quicker and far faster and far simpler with less oversight by factory workers. Industrial 3D printers are unattended manufacturing devices. You send a file, you go down to the printer, you press print and you walk away. And the Australian Financial Review said industrial enterprises must revisit their operations. Additive manufacturing creates myriads of new opportunities, opportunities for how, when and where. And we need to decide if we are to continue to be a manufacturing or grow again to be a manufacturing nation, what mix of these processes works for us. So that's um, the end of my presentation about how we could utilize 3D printing to change manufacturing and change innovation in Australia today. Uh, hopefully it added some value to you. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to use the app um, or you're welcome to send emails to me at a later stage and I will answer them. Uh, my email address is dominic at tasman3dprinters.com.au and one of our team across Australia and New Zealand would be quite happy to assist. So thank you very much.